every so often, probably about once a month, more or less, I like to mention why I read these and why they're so, why I chose them specifically in my life, you know, to be a part of my devotional time. And with Daily Light, it was interesting because, I mean, originally I found it just by going into a used bookstore. And uh, I think it cost me, oh, maybe 50 cents or a dollar. <laughs> well, no, I think it cost me 50 cents. But then down the road, as I read it and as I enjoyed it, I researched the history on it about the family, the Baxters that had lived in England and how they had been the father, the mother, and the children sitting around and they would share a scripture that they had read and that another member of the family would participate in that by sharing another scripture that fit what the previous scripture said, or at least the same topic. And as this became a game for the children to grow up in memorization probably or some other form of thinking on these things that were told in Deuteronomy that the book of the law should now depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it when thou risest up, when thou sittest down, when thou walkest, when thou goest on thy way, that this was like a technique for the father and the mother to share with the children in those days an activity that was centered on scripture that was fun. And they would do it and they would enjoy it. Because in those days, <laughs> they didn't have television and iPods and iMacs and everything else. But then one day, one of the members of the family got the idea that they should write it down, that as they remembered and as they thought on these scriptures that they passed around, they would record them and then gradually, as it grew, it became a devotional. And then it became a morning devotion and a night devotion. And that's how Daily Light came about. It's one of the earlier, not the earliest, but one of the earlier Christian devotionals that has become a classic in Christian literature because all it is is just simply scripture, line upon line, put together somewhat in a topic based upon the first scripture that's read. So God has always used that in my life, you know, to reinforce my study of the Word, but also to give me sometimes a little snack, like a little tidbit. For me, sometimes, actually, it was like a starving man that's just getting his first drink of water. It was oh, just more than I needed, <laughs> and sometimes it's all I could have. In daily life, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And you know, with such a sacrifice that was made by God on our behalf to cleanse us from all of our sins, both past, the present, and the future, because you and I will sin today, and we will sin tomorrow, and we will sin the next day should we live that long <laughs> and the Lord tarry. But in the normal course of events, a righteous man falls down seven times and rises up again. And what that reminds us is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, not just for the sake of being prior to salvation, but that every day we wrestle with that aspect of transgressing the law of perfection in some way that causes us and reminds us that we do need that changed reality that God is creating in us to make us perfect. 
Because Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. It isn't one of that, at the beginning, we thought it up, and at the end, he decides that we are okay. No, he began it, and he will complete it unto the day of salvation. For he has said, he would present us faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. Until that day, <laughs> we need to confess our sins. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. The prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, a high priest, holy, harmless, and undefiled. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Whosoever is born of God sins not, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and that wicked one touches him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. You know, it's not saying that you're perfect or that you are going to become perfect in this life. You won't. But the perfect sacrifice for all that you are has been made, and the realization of that as God works it out of you, as you deal with those around you, as you are living in the world that you are participating in, that is what God accomplishes through you, both to do and to will of his good pleasure, which is the salvation of souls, knowing that God has already forgiven. God will forgive, and we do confess our sins to him, because it separates us from our relationship with him. As you well know, that if you offend someone, how often do you walk on the other side of the street? If you hurt somebody's feelings, how much do you avoid, or have you heard this expression, I, I don't like confrontation, you know, and so they avoid it. Jesus is the direct reality of the contradiction to that term. He says we embrace confrontation because we confess our sins. We are forgiven of our sins and we are cleansed from all unrighteousness and then we are able to restore relationships that have been bruised, that have been hurt, and that have been damaged because of our own actions and attitudes, that God can work within us, both to heal, to help, to hinder the work of Satan that divides us, and to cause us to come to realization that because God is love, what he's trying to bring out in you and those around you is simply one thing. And it's always been just one thing. Love, bottom line. God is love. God loves you. God loves the person that you may have fought against, and God loves the sinner and the saint. Now, God's love is such that he desires for those to not choose the way of damnation, but rather choose the way of salvation that his son has provided. We are those ambassadors to explain these things and to share that so we might bring many others to the same place where we are that we would be all sons and daughters of God. Did you know that's what you are? A son of God? You are, so how dare anyone raise a rally and cry against you? But since we are sons of God, we ought to crucify our flesh and walk according to the Spirit. <laughs>